Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. I am Arusia Kaprelian, Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture and Urbanism at the School of Architecture at USC and Director of the Landscape Futures Lab. And together with Allison Hirsch, the Associate Professor and Director of the Landscape Architecture and Urbanism Program, we are the co-curators of the series. Before we begin today's conversation on archival grounds, I'd like to acknowledge the grounds from which uh, some of us are speaking today. Both Allison and I are located on the ancestral grounds of the Gabrielino Tongva people, who historically inhabited the San Gabriel Valley area around present day Pasadena and Altadena. We also acknowledge the grounds on which our institution, the University of Southern California sits, which is the indigenous land of the Tongva people, and along with the Chumash, Tataviam, Serrano, Cojilla, Juanino, and Luceno people, uh, they're associated with lands that USC also occupies around Southern California. We pay our respects to the traditional caretakers of this land, their ancestors, elders, relations past, present, and forthcoming. It's critical not only to acknowledge the genocide, slavery, violence, displacement, and settlement that brings us here today, but to actively address the particular harms that settler colonialism and institutions who benefit from colonialism, including USC, perpetuate on indigenous lands and peoples. We recognize this land acknowledgement is limited and requires us to engage in an ongoing process of learning and accountability through action. I'd like to also take a moment to acknowledge the students who have been working with Allison and I to put these conversations together. Uh, thank yous go out to Jared Egner, Edgar McKnight, who will join us later, Hannah, Michael Flynn, and Leslie Dinkin. We're also extremely grateful for the Landscape Justice Initiative and the generosity of the Grant and Shea uh, Kirkpatrick Landscape Architecture and Urbanism Leadership Fund, which has made this series possible. Tonight's conversation on archival grounds is the fourth in the series, building on and extending beyond the themes we've been exploring through the first three panels. Material grounds, which focused on deep consideration of the grounds physical matter. Working grounds, which engaged the embodied practice of work as it relates to the physicality of the ground. And ancestral grounds, uh, which was the last one, which focused on the connections of indigenous communities to the material of the ground, including the stories and myths that it continues to tell. All previous conversations have been recorded and are archived on our website and we welcome you to visit should you have missed them live. We are so thrilled to have an archeologist, a public historian, an activist, a curator, and a landscape architect joining us tonight to provide a range of perspectives and methodological frames through which to explore uh, the ground as archive. Our moderator, Shannon Mattern, is a professor of anthropology at the New School for Social, Re uh, uh, Social, Social Research. Her writing and teaching focus on archives, libraries, and other media spaces, media infrastructures, special epistemologies and mediated sensation and exhibition. She's the author of the new downtown library, Designing with Communities, Deep Mapping, The Media City, and Code and Clay, Data and Dirt. She's also the author of the forthcoming book titled The City is Not a Computer. She contributes a regular long form column about urban data and mediated infrastructures to Places Journal, and she collaborates on public design and interactive projects and exhibitions. We're incredibly grateful and lucky to have Shannon. Uh, thanks so much for agreeing to lead today's conversation and welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and especially with all these wonderful panelists. Um, I am joining you from the unceded territory of the, the, sorry, the Lenape people, just a little bit north of New York City. So I'm gonna offer a few brief introductory comments and then introduce our panelists. Okay, so take, um, kind of launching off of the theme for this evening, um, some of our earliest archival materials were themselves drawn from the ground, as you can see here with the cuneiform tablet. And the ground itself in the form of repurposed mines commonly serves as a geologic repository for government records, historical photographs, old Hollywood films, and increasingly servers. Yet the ground itself is also an archive, one that yields critical data for some of our most pressing and persistent challenges. For example, 
Understanding and predicting climate, information historian Paul Edwards notes, is one of the hardest challenges science has ever tackled because it involves many interlocking systems, including the atmosphere, the oceans, the cryosphere, meaning ice and snow, land surfaces, soil and refle uh, reflectance, and the biosphere, end quote. The, the data that feed those models are harvested from contemporary and historical instrument readings going back 150 years or so from surface stations, weather ships, ocean buoys, and satellites. But the ability to model deeper historical patterns over the past millennium, or for a few hundred thousand years, depends upon the use of proxies from the ground, ice cores, marine sediments, pollens, tree rings, corals, boreholes, cave stalagmites and stalactites, which index past climate events and stand in for empirical measurements. The work of predicting the fate of our icebergs and ismai, our corals and coastal regions, our flora and fauna, and the grounds upon which they live, requires that we turn to the ground itself as a data source. Climate's big data archive is as big as the world. In fact, it is the world. The geologic field or strategically selected samples of it become archival documents in the same way that for pioneering information scientist Suzanne Brie, quote, the photographs and the catalogs of the stars, the stones in, um, in the Museum of Mineralogy, and the animals that are cataloged and shown in a zoo are documents. In sub subdomains of geology, Sarah Randine explains, physical objects become data once they have been used in research, along with their associated metadata and description. There's a transition from a rock being just a rock to it now representing scientific knowledge with its connection to the documentation. There's a long history within the geosciences of, reg of regarding the earth itself, the terrestrial gr ground as an archive, not unlike the one that historians consult. With the discovery of stratigraphy in the early 19th century, David Sapolsky explains, geohistorians, naturalists, and antiquarians came to see the earth quote, as having a deep history, which could be read in the succession of fossils embedded in the strata of the Earth's crust, end quote. Even earlier, in 1766, Swedish chemist Tobern Olaf Bergman proposed that fossils are actually medallions of a sort, which were laid down on the origination, the originating Earth's surface, whose layers are archives older than all human annals, and which appropriately investigated give much light on the natural history of this, our dwelling place, end quote. According to Sapolsky, the such archival antiquarian geological analogies multiplied through the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and researchers extended their archive across multiple levels. The earth itself, the fossil record, or specimen collections extracted from the earth, visual representations of those collections, textual catalogs, and then eventually databases. Climate scientists, paleoclimatologists, paleooceanographers, geologists, and researchers in related fields probe global, global patterns across deep time using not only voluminous databases and material records collections, but also substantial slices of the earth and sea. In an article from which this short introduction is adapted, I describe how ice cores and sediment, soil, and rock samples are collected in the field, processed in the archive, preserved, and transformed into documents. I explain, for example, how a sediment core is harvested at sea, brought into a repository, segmented, halved, documented, cataloged, QR coded, refrigerated, and parceled out for testing at labs all around the world using a variety of methods and scientific instruments and, dis and disciplinary knowledges. A tray full of mud, which in any other context might seem to be of quite uncertain aesthetic and epistemic value, um, can here unlock millions of years of environmental history. The remains of microorganism shells can signal changes in ocean currents and species migration. Sediment accumulations can chronicle hundreds of thousands of years of seismic history. Detritus can track the, the roots of floating icebergs and fossilized bacteria can offer clues to the origins of life. The cores in Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Core Repository, which I visited in the summer of 2017, archive 130 million years of geologic history. Yet all that data isn't simply latent in the cores waiting to be discovered. Paul Edwards reminds us that without models, there are no data. Similarly, without geologic archives, there'd be no material climate data. Archival practices shape not only how vast databases are structured and shared, but also how the ground yields information. They make records, or sorry, they make rocks into records. 
While the geologic curators with whom I spoke referred to their work as archiving, we might assume that their everyday material practice are quite our practices, that is, are quite unlike those in a manuscript or a municipal archive. You won't find many white gloves in a sediment repository, for example, or electric saws in the manuscript archive. Ramdeen, a geologist and information scientist, celebrates geological archives' historical commitment to curation, but laments their relative lack of expertise in collection management, which sometimes means weeding out materials. Also, la relative lack of, of um, expertise in metadata, user services, and long-term care and storage. Quote, concerns over sustainability and interoperability are high, she says. Meanwhile, ac academic records manager Ira Tanzi, who works with more traditional textual media, um, regrets her own field's estrangement from the physical field, the ground, its reluctance to look out into the terrain beyond its, on, its own anthropocentric borders. We archivists think of our records as something created by, for, and about humans. Anything from the natural world may be considered data, and historically, we have tended to leave data to other professions, she says. Despite these professional and protocological gaps, core repositories, marine sample collections, manuscript collections, and digital archives have much more in common than the geologic scope of their collections. By thinking across their collections, by recognizing a shared commitment to resilience and responsibility, these curators of code, codices, and cores can help to build more sustainable institutions that can better serve broader endeavors to build a more resilient world. Together, they can recognize the variety of natural and textual documents that yield critical data about geological, climatic, and related cultural processes. They can construct protocols and standards so that their collection materials are widely accessible and useful. They can advocate for adequate funding, which they very rarely have, and other necessary forms of material support. And they can enhance each other's practices by posing big questions about the epistemological and ontological breadth of their fields of operation and the existential uncertainties they can help us face. And while climate change is, of course, a, a profound and pressing concern, it isn't the only matter that the ground as archive allows us to dig into or sift through. This afternoon or evening, depending upon what ground you are sitting or standing on right now, we'll hear from four speakers who will offer four boreholes, we could say, into the archival ground. First, uh, Ayana Omalada Flewellen, an archaeologist, artist, and assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, uh, Riverside, will help us to consider how both the archives and the ground yield archaeological and documentary records central to the construction and dissemination of history, particularly with regard to a state little princess on the island of St. Croix, um, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, a ground claimed by various colonizing forces. As Flewellen writes, the residuum of Danish, colon Danish colonialism and the lasting impact of US neo-imperial neo rule shaped both the material and meta uh, metaphorical ground in and on which this archeological research takes place. I'm especially eager to hear how the grounding of her own practice in black feminist epistemological um, uh, theories uh, and practices further cultivates the archeological and archival ground from which we grow historical narratives. Then Catherine Jenkins, Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture at The Ohio State University and co-founder of Present Practice, will help us to imagine the body as an archive of grounded practice and walking itself as a methodology. Walking generates embodied knowledge of the grounds we inhabit and our position within them. Such physical cartography, as she calls it, produces traces on the land, on the land transforming it into a topographic archival text of sorts. And as those pathways are tracked and recorded via GPS, they generate digital archival records that can serve as grounds for further study and design. Then we have Liv Subchenko, Director of the Humanities Action Lab at, at Rutgers University, Newark, who networks a constellation of institutions on widely distributed grounds, universities, issue organizations, public spaces in 40 plus cities, to produce public humanities projects that address how justice is rooted in place. The lab's various projects address environmental justice and states of incarceration, including, in particular, uh, Carcel Ground, the, um, and, and especially Guantanamo Bay. Their work is then grounded in a variety of sites, in traveling exhibitions, web projects, public programs, and other distributed learning platforms. 
Finally, Aurora Tang, Curator, Researcher, and Program Director at the Center for Land Use Interpretation, will address CLUI's investigation of the Bonneville Basin, which covers much of northwestern Utah and parts of eastern Nevada and southern Idaho, and has, across its geologic and cultural history, transformed from inland sea to salt flats and shrinking saline lake over thousands of years, while also serving as ground for atomic research and visionary earthworks. Tang is examining, she writes, the cultural products for, and byproducts of this landscape's morphology, exploring themes of survival, preparedness, isolation, desiccation, inundation, salinification, disintegration, dissipation, and resilience. I hope that through our discussion, we can add to that list of actions and approaches to working the ground, mining, excavating, traversing, stewarding, and so forth, that reflect the myriad methods through which we can transform a ground into an archive and simultaneously appreciate how archives are themselves grounded in place. So thank you. So I think we now turn it over to Ayana. Thank you so much, Han Shannon, for that fantastic introduction. I'm so looking forward to being in conversation with so many esteemed colleagues and scholars. It's so fantastic to get folks from a wide variety of disciplines in conversation with one another. So rarely happens. Um, let me click share screen. This. Can folks see that? Fantastic, I always get nervous. So as the abstract for today's discussion states, the ground is a material, the ground is a material register. As an archeologist that focuses on the era of enslavement and its afterlives <coughs> in the Circum Caribbean, the ground holds histories that have been silenced and erased in the archive of the transatlantic slave trade, which is so heavily pillared by colonial documentation designed to commodify and dehumanize blackness. For many doing archeological work on the African diaspora, the grounds where Africans and their descendants lived and labeled and labored while enduring tremendous violence in a system based on their subjugation may be the only record we have of their lived experiences. When I was asked to participate in this discussion, I began asking myself, what does our ground hold? And I began to think about that with my work, especially on St. Croix. And my answers, on St. Croix in the Virgin Islands where I do my research, the ground holds centuries of indigenous life, both seasonal and long-term occupation. St. Croix's grounds hold the subsequent displacement of indigenous Taino people by European colonial powers. And at various points in time, St. Croix was occupied by Spain, Great Britain, the Netherlands, France, the Knights of Malta, and Denmark. St. Croix's grounds hold the histories of African enslavement built to uphold the production of sugar and rum. St. Croix's grounds are still taking account of the impact of U.S. imperial rule. And I finished with St. Croix's grounds captures the stratigraphy of colonial and imperial violence. Its expansive soils manifest the collapsing of histories, creating a palimpsest landscape where historical injustices to flesh and land are entangled with the present day subjugation of black and brown people, nutrient stripped soils and hollowed out coral reefs. So as an archeologist formerly trained in terrestrial archeology span with a love of maritime heritage preservation, my work on St. Croix has centered on unearthing the experiences of enslaved afro Caribbeans at the Estate Little Princess. And this is just a video of the site itself. And the Estate Little Princess was established by Danish governor Frederick Moth in, 1740, in 1749 to operate primarily as a sugar plantation. Over the years, the plantation estate expanded to accommodate a growing enslaved population and new structures were added as the production of sugar and rum shifted from wind to steam power. And as with other plantations in historic buildings on the island, many of the structures were fashioned with a combination of lime and coral tabby excavated from the nearby sea floor. While the extent of such coral mining occurred has yet to be quantified, there is still a connection between the environmental degradation that occurred on land and underwater. Sugar remained the primary commodity 
um, but ground provisions were also cultivated to varying degrees on the landscape. And at its height in 1771, the estate accounted for 141 enslaved individuals and encompassed about 200 acres of land. And after the 1849 abolition of slavery in St. Croix, the plantation continued to operate with low wage labor. The plantation fell into um, disrepair during the first half of the 20th century with the general decline of sugar production on the island. And in 1949, 200 years after the initial inception of the sugar, of sugar, of the plantation estate, it was sold to Clayton and Opal Shoemaker as a summer home. In 1980, the estate was listed as the, on the National Registrar of Historic Places and was willed to the Nature Conservancy in 1991. Today, the primary structures on the estate sit on about 25 acres of land administered by the Nature Conservancy, and it currently serves as a regional headquarters. And it's this, and it's at this particular site, it really presents a unique circumstance where cultural and environmental preservation and, cult and, um, and preservation efforts are really resting atop of the same ground. And I really hope we can talk about the intersections of both environmental conservation and cultural preservation in our um, discussion later this evening. And here I just have a map of the estate from the 1980 National Register of Historic Places. And we can see on the site, the planter's home, which is currently being interpreted as a historic hospital site, a sugar factory, sugar mill, and the enslaved and, and village area. And just to sum it up, the estate is really a multi-component site with architecture associated with both the Danish and other European and American plantation owners and supervisors, as well as the enslaved and later free African and afro caribbean residents. And the research that I do at the site, along with my other co-conspirators, really focuses on how afro caribbeans from enslavery through freedom, so thinking 1754 through 1917, interacted with their natural and social environment as a process of self-making through a multi-scale analysis of household, community, and society. And with this question in mind, our research has really centered on the past lived experiences of afro caribbeans at the site, with the excavations really focusing in on the enslaved village area. And archaeological investigations of the site began in 2017 with a phase one um, project really centered on a systematic shovel probe survey of the enslaved village area where afro caribbeans once lived and labored during enslavement and post-emancipation. And excavations from previous field seasons have resulted in the recovery of over 14,000 artifacts. However, our shovel probe survey so far has only really begun to unearth the material culture pertaining specifically to the era of enslavement and post-emancipation. And at the estate Little Princess, the six by three meter coral duplexes where the enslaved lived, let me go back one second, this video will play. There we go. At the estate Little Princess, the six by three meter core duplexes where the enslaved Africans lived and labored were such a small space that we knew the majority of daily activities took place outside of them. And excavations of shared spaces between the coral structures have the potential to reveal artifact assemblages that relate to cooking, gathering, as well as craft production. In addition, we see a lot of or several several, um, several post holes that were found at the site that really speak to the manipulation of bedrock and the use of shared space as either outdoor structures attached to the coral structures or perhaps even the foundations of earlier wattle and daub cabins. So it's a really layered um, site in that regard. And then a few of the artifacts recovered our shovel probe survey is really um, implemented to really seek out artifact assemblages pertaining to the era of enslavement. And the site itself was occupied for over 200 years with it actually with many of the um, structures at the, at the site being transformed into guest homes. So there's a way that actually locating discrete artifact assemblages that date to the era of enslavement have been particularly tricky to um, decipher. But several different wear types were recovered at the estate Little Princess that speak that come from a variety of different origins throughout Europe and really speak as a testament to the ports that were open on St. Croix 
and also the level of access and investment among, among the enslaved population. And more of this and further ceramic analysis is um, required to really piece apart um, this work, but I look forward to talking more about that during the discussion section. And we're also recovering a number of different low-fired Afro-Caribbean wares that are sculpted on site, really used from different clay sources around the island. And then my own particular research really thinks through how small finds were covered at the estate little princess, like beads, buttons, buckles, and jewelry. Um, a couple of samples I have here on the, on the slide itself really speak to sartorial practices that were engaged by enslaved Africans at the site as they navigated the precarity of their everyday lives and really forged spaces of possibility through dress. And then for us as archeologists, the ground not only contains material culture, but also speaks to the lives of people in the past. And the ground, the manipulation of the ground seen in the cultivation of cash crops like we see at the estate little princess with the cultivation of sugar. Um, with the cultivation of sugarcane, as well as coal mining that we see that has taken place across island. We also see the construction and the manipulation of water flow at the site. And all of this contains history of the ways in which the ground itself holds this knowledge and this history around um, human survival in many ways. And I don't wanna take up too much time because I know I'm, I hit right at the 10 minute mark, but I do look forward to being in further dialogue about the ways in which the ground acts as an archive of the past, really witnessing our present, especially as we think through the lasting impacts of colonialism on flesh and on land, um, both above and underwater at this intersection of both cultural preservation and environmental conservation. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you very much, Rihanna. And now we move over to Katie. Great, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate um, in this conversation this evening. Um, so I employ walking as an analytical and generative tool as a way of revealing existing site conditions and responding to them. As the body moves through space, it compacts the ground, displaces air and transports seeds, pollen and dirt. But the ground does not always preserve the memory of these displacements for long. But with the aid of GPS technology, I can trace how a path of movement responds to and affects specific terrestrial conditions. I walk the landscape repeatedly in various seasons and record the itinerary of each walk via GPS. By returning to the same site over and over again, I become attuned to changes in the environment, many of which are perceived through touch rather than by sight. Things like the softness of the ground, the dampness of the air, the texture of vegetation all affect how I move through the landscape. So collected over time, the accretion of these digital threads registers shifts in sight phenomena that can be felt, but not always seen. In this way, walking becomes a form of design drawing and an archive for physical interactions with the landscape. So this evening, I'm gonna share an ecological restoration project designed via walking and a series of collaborative maps constructed with my students. So Meadowlines, a project that I've been working on since 2018, is interested in patterns in the ground and how a shifting composition of plant species might influence not only how we look at the landscape, but also how we move through it. In this project, the ground plane and the growth that emerges from it are important mediums of communication that both direct and register my own movements. Meadowlines employs the body and GPS technology as a tool to generate precise spatial data for design. Using a one acre test site at the Waterman Agricultural Natural Resources Laboratory in Columbus, Ohio, I have recorded, visualized and redesigned the landscape by walking it routinely for over two years. 
The cumulative geospatial data that I collect provides a script for intervention that I use to transform what was formerly a monoculture of soybeans into a complex pollinator meadow. This site is representative of the massive industrial production of corn and soy that exists in the Midwest. And the mechanization and intense systems of ecological control in place to produce these crops on this scale informed my design response. One of the goals of this project is to demonstrate a way of transforming a degraded agricultural site into one that has ecological and aesthetic value using minimal economic and carbon inputs. So now this meadow grows conspicuously among orthogonal rows of corn and soybeans that surround it. The meadow invites visitors into it via a series of paths that change seasonally. So new, new paths emerge via mowing and clearing and old paths recede as they grow over and are reabsorbed by the field. These paths are a type of drawing, um, but possess a critical spatial and, and sensory dimension that distinguishes them. They become drawings to move through. This approach is distinguished by its ability to integrate new site information into a flexible, constantly shifting design. So like a feedback loop, the meadow can integrate incremental design changes across seasons that respond to the successes or failures of previous maintenance decisions, paths, and emerging ecological zones. I can walk across the meadow when its grasses are low and imprint the memory of that movement into the field by mowing its trail. The following spring, evidence of these interventions remains as bands of vigorous growth and distinct combinations of species. So the first set of paths uh, was designed via walking the acre numerous times during the spring of 2019 and recording where these walks aligned. Um, so on the left, you see a compilation of walks from 2019 and the north, south, east, west armature that emerges from their overlap. And at that time, um, the meadow species composition um, had not developed a lot of complexity yet. Uh, so I found myself being directed primarily by the microtopography of the site, specifically a small swale um, that runs east-west across the center of the field. Uh, the drawing on the right here shows a compilation of, of walks from 2020. And in the second season of growth, many new species began to germinate, which meant that the meadow's texture, height, and colors became much more varied. And in response, instead of crossing the field along the swale, my movements became much more exploratory, reacting to the emergence of various species. So the loops that you see in this drawing are a result of my tracing the extensive seed dispersal of the plant Rudbeckia. And this is an example of how the changing ecology of the meadow has caused me to change how I move through it. The GPS drawings are also a useful record of the labor and time invested in the site. So here the drawing on the left shows my movements when I was collecting seeds in the meadow last November. And the drawing on the right shows my movements as I was photographing and documenting the meadow in the snow this January. So the detail embedded in the GPS drawings uh, is a direct outcome of the extent of physical exertion uh, and time spent in the landscape. And then here I've walked in the trails left by deer occupying the site. Um, so I'm registering their modifications to the meadow. And I think it's really important to note that through this process of walking and recording, I'm able to generate my own primary source site map that is free from many of the biases um, of ready-made uh, maps and data. Um, and as you can see from these different compilations, the site map is continually evolving, reflecting not just a single snapshot of the land, but rather it's changing conditions over time. As we walk, we are continuously carving and dividing space. By cutting volumes out of the field, I'm exploring movement as something sculptural. And through this project, I'm testing how the ephemeral traces of a walk can assume both a visual form in drawing 
and a physical form in the landscape. In addition to examining the outcomes of a single designer walking the landscape, I also work with groups of students. So I've created a series of cross-disciplinary field exercises in which students walk and map the environment collaboratively. Um, in the seminar that I'm teaching right now, uh, students map Waterman Farm by walking and recording their movement via GPS. And the traces of all students across numerous site visits are collected and overlaid together to produce an evolving site map that reflects every participant's individual relationship with the land, but also the class's collective movements um, over time. And this is a way of archiving our explorations of a site. Um, and in reviewing these maps, it becomes easy to see where we spend a lot of time um, and which areas of a site have yet to be explored. Unlike a conventional map, which describes an environment, these maps des describe the relationship of people reacting to their environment. Um, so on the left, you see a fairly conventional map of the 260 acre farm at, represented in a fixed moment in time. And on the right, uh, you see the same site represented by aggregating walks taken by 12 students. And then here on the left is another map of the farm made by the same group of students uh, walking the site, but on different days. Uh, so you can imagine then that on any given day, the collaborative map of the site will be unique. The purpose of this kind of site map is not to create an inventory of every space at the farm, um, but <coughs> rather to situate the designer's physical experience in the field in relation to the events and conditions that give rise to that experience. As my students walk the farm from winter to spring, they're developing an awareness of how the changing site is directing and impacting their body's movements. And through this process, my students are building up an archive of physical memories um, of this landscape. So by producing maps that record our reactions to environmental phenomena, I hope to challenge how we delineate space in both our physical and digital worlds. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. So now we will move over to Liz. Okay, can everybody see? We were having a little trouble with my uh, tech earlier. Does that look good? Okay. Um, I really want to thank uh, Allison and Rusiak for organizing this and, and for including me because having a chance to meet and learn from all of you um, is uh, just a, a really extraordinary experience. Um, I also want to note that I'm uh, appearing here on Muncie. Lenape land, not far from Shannon, um, maybe a little farther south. Um, and my uh, background and therefore the questions that I'm asking are a little bit more, um, might seem a little more mundane, but I actually am eager to, um, to open a question that's quite practical that this um, has afforded me the opportunity to pose. Um, which, uh, you know, I've been struggling with for a while. Um, I work at the intersection of memory and place and human rights. Um, and one of the challenges that has dogged me throughout this is how to make uh, the material record in ground legible and usable in trials. Um, in um, for people who are pursuing um, really specific um, forms of justice and accountability. Uh, so I thought I would share, um, and this is fun too, because uh, it's an invitation to talk about work I haven't done in a long time, but I'm still very um, concerned with. So um, I'll share two quick stories um, of sites of clandestine torture and detention uh, that I've worked with that really um, pose this issue. One of which um, 
as a story I only remembered when talking to Allison and Rusiak over a meal one time. So they've really brought this to the fore for me as something that's, um, I think, generative um, for all of us, I hope. So the story, um, I'll enter it in uh, 1978 in a quiet and kind of verdant leafy suburb uh, right outside of Buenos Aires. Um, towards the end of Argentina's period of state terrorism. Uh, and in this year, a sort of grand estate uh, that was known as the Mansión Cere for the family um, that owned it, burned to the ground. And many at that time suspected that behind these gates and hedges was um, a secret detention center operated by the Air Force where um, people that were suspected or accused of, of um, communist activities were, um, were taken and uh, tortured. So there was a, a sort of, it was a known secret, but forensic archeologists who were working towards the right to bring prosecutions needed to find evidence enough um, to grant them the access to the site to do an official excavation. So lawyers began by interviewing survivors of torture um, any, who didn't know anywhere in, in the region, um, as well as people who are living in other stately homes in this neighborhood. And so the neighbors, and you can imagine they're all this, the houses are kind of covered with these gates and hedges, claimed um, not to have seen or heard anything. And the survivors, couldn't say where their torture had taken place um, because everyone when they were kidnapped or disappeared uh, was blindfolded. Um, so they could only see what was visible at the bottom of their blindfolds, um, which mainly the main memory that seemed everyone seemed to share was of marble, um, little glimpses of black and white tile. Um, and also the sound of kind of the echo of boots on marble stairs, um, which was a sound that signaled that a guard was coming to escort you um, for a session. Forensic archeologists searched for the marble, but um, around the Mansion Cere, there were only little tiny shards. They had, the Air Force had eradicated it very um, thoroughly but also the patterns and the colors that people remembered and described could be found in like any house anywhere in the region. So it was just not really a distinctive uh, piece of evidence. But what the Air Force didn't uh, take into account was the organic evidence. Um, and so it turned out that a seed kind of broke this case wide open. Um, so at, probing a little more deeply, um, interviewers you know, asked drivers to, to recall other aspects of their experience. And it began with a man named Osvaldo Sanchez, who remembered that after a session of torture by electrocution, he was really um, begging a guard for water. And the guard said, I can't give you water because with the electricity running through your body, um, it would kill you. But if you take these peaches, they'll quench your thirst, um, and, but you'll also be all right. So with the story of these peaches began to appear in other testimonies um, that the lawyers were taking um, in different places. And this began to connect people whose stories had been separate, um, but then could be, now could be suddenly established to have taken place in the same site. Um, and it also suggested that peaches were the thing to look for. So um, the forensic archeologists um, in fact got um, the uh, ability and the right and access to the site. Um, and unfortunately I need to, <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. Um, and um, were, uh, able to do a full investigation uh, and found um, a huge number of piles of peach pit throughout. And in fact, found a concentration of them in a particular 
area of the site, which was a basement room, so they could also establish exactly where um, the detention and the torture took place. So eventually these pits um, became the main sort of, they were the ones who testified and the main support and archive or documents for prosecutions of the Air Force officials who worked there. Um, and then also became the kind of anchor of a long-term memory site. This is actually a sort of exhibit case that's around, um, around the site. So I uh, was invited to visit the site when I was founding director of something called the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Um, and the reason uh, we were invited is that after the legal team, after the prosecutions had become successful and after the legal team had moved on uh, and had documented the oral histories, the testimony, all the, docu all the paper documents, um, they were not archiving the peach pits. Um, they were kind of, the peach pits were abandoned again. So local activists uh, in the pursuit of a kind of long-term culture of accountability through memory um, wanted to kind of animate these for justice over the long term um, and uh, preserve them in this different form. So this began to um, introduce this challenge of the um, gap between kind of legal archive, legal testimony and, um, and long-term collective accountability um, in the ground or with, with the uh, ground. Um, so the second story is just years later, I received another call um, about another kind of um, ground-based witness to secret torture and detention. And this was from an ACLU lawyer who was defending uh, Khalil Sheikh Mohammed, um, who was one of the, the leaders of the 9-11 attacks. And she had learned that Camp X-Ray, which was, um, the first detention facility at the US Naval Station at Guantanamo Bay to be built was slated for demolition. And so her uh, charge was to defend um, her client, this individual person, um, and, and to uh, expose his experience over the last two decades. Um, but the foundation uh, for Camp X-Ray, and I'm so uh, happy to be sharing this panel with Iona, um, was laid you know, centuries before that, and um, this ground contains layers of um, uh, of colonial and, uh, and 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 colony and empire. So this is this little forty five square mile imperial outpost um, is suspended in a legal and material kind of state of exception. It's also often called the legal black hole. After the War of eighteen ninety eight, the U S. extracted a lease for the Bay from Cuba as a price of its independence. I used uh, the map that's in the um, Stars and Stripes military um, uh, newspaper. So you can see their point of view, the, their view of this site. Um, so the, the lease uh, ensured Cuba's total sovereignty, remaining retaining its sovereignty, but the US gained, quote, total jurisdiction and control. So the result is a square of kind of land and sea where nobody's law applies. Um, and it is so isolated from the rest of, from both the US and the rest of Cuba, um, that it's actually become a kind of de facto wildlife preserve for uh, a variety of endemic but endangered species. Um, but on this legal foundation, then was built a kind of architectural infrastructure that's been used and reused to detain people outside of US law and outside of public scrutiny. And in fact, Guantanamo has been closed repeatedly only to be reopened for another group. Um, Camp X-Ray was originally built as a kind of like prison for uh, some of the more than 20,000 Haitian refugees who were detained in a tent city um, in the early 1990s um, uh, with a whole, uh, prevented from entering the US as uh, suspected as being carriers of the AIDS virus. Their, uh, the refugees' protests of their racist and indefinite detention um, inspired this incredible social movement, this massive legal battle to close Guantanamo in 1993, which in fact was successful. 
Um, but one year later, the site uh, reopened um, to indefinitely detain a massive wave of, of Cuban refugees, the last of whom won her freedom um, and her release two years later, which caused the world to declare uh, Gitmo closed once again. But just uh, six years after that, um, after 9-11, the government uh, was seeking a place to detain enemy combatants and Gitmo was chosen explicitly for its ground, for the legal and architectural foundations um, for detaining people outside of US law that it, that it had. Um, so the first enemy combatants, as they were called from Afghanistan, were brought there in April of 2002. But as the number of detainees uh, exploded and as the war on terror kind of uh, metastasized, um, the military built a new and larger facility nearby and Camp X-Ray was declared closed. Um, but by 2007, it was swallowed by Vines and Kudzu, uh, appearing abandoned. But we now know that X-Ray was in fact kept open for several years uh, as another as a secret site within Guantanamo, but within Gitmo for the torture of high value detainees. So when in 2009, President Obama declared his intention to close Guantanamo, um, the stewards of Mansion Cere, that's the site with the peach pits and other sites of conscience um, that I coordinated came together to figure out how we could expose the layers of use and abuse um, hidden in Gitmo's ground with no possibility of making this ground accessible. It was not like in a suburb of a major city like Mansion Cere. So instead, um, we engaged young people um, from across the country to explore its different strata from where they were. Um, so there were cities, you know, everywhere from Miami and Minnesota, um, they um, pay, teamed up with people who had been held or grew up or served or uh, had experiences at Gitmo in many different ways and many, many different uh, um, periods of time. Um, and um, explored um, each one sort of chapter of the base's history and created a um, oral history archive and um, a sort of ongoing dialogue among people in different places who were exploring different chapters of this history uh, to, and finally created a um, collectively created a traveling exhibit that opened in New York and then um, moved to all the communities that helped create it with sort of public dialogues and actions in each place. Um, this was just an effort to help people connect um, this place that was so remote and hidden to their own and identify what issues were connected. Um, whether it was in Indianapolis, looking at supermax prisons, or Istanbul, looking at the, looking at um, the sort of global rise of Islamophobia. Um, and we did create an archive in the traditional sense, but the ground archive was unprotected. Um, so when that ACLU lawyer called to say that Camp X-Ray was slated for demolition, she was speaking only with the ability to um, spend her time and energy on um, saving forensic evidence related to her client in the few months that he was there in 2002. But she knew equally as well that, that uh, the ground contained a century of, uh, you know, well, centuries of um, record that were equally important in even explaining his individual experience. Um, but also that this, this longer history and this more uh, layers uh, were critical for laying the foundation of uh, conscience for future generations. So the case is still pending, but this um, has really just raised for me the question of how to make ground legible to people pursuing justice in the very limited short term and the long term. So, you know, in practical terms, I've really come to recognize that when it comes to uncovering and preserving the material record of sites of torture and detention, 
lawyers are our first responders. They are the people on whom we need to rely, but their mandates severely limit, you know, what kind of evidence they can uncover, how they can preserve it, and how it can be used because their goal is immediate justice for individual clients and not creating uh, ongoing spaces for reckoning in a participatory um, collective way in pursuit of, of a collective accountability. Um, so there is this gap where the ground is neglected. Um, so I'm really interested in building that bridge and I welcome any of your ideas on how. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. And now we'll move to our final speaker, Aurora. Wow, thanks so much everybody, all of my fellow panelists. It's really amazing to be here in dialogue with you all, so thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen. Hope everyone can see that, say something if you can't. Um, so I'm gonna speak about my work with the Center for Land Use Interpretation. The Center for Land Use Interpretation was founded in 1994 as a nonprofit research and arts and culture organization interested in understanding uh, the contemporary landscape issues in the United States. Technically, according to our mission, we are dedicated to the increase and diffusion of knowledge about how our nation's lands are apportioned utilized and perceived. Perhaps more simply put, we are interested in the ways in which humans interact with the land they inhabit and transform and in finding new meanings and understanding in the intentional and incidental forms that we individually and collectively create. All of these physical marks that we leave um, and make on the land, on the ground, the man-made landscape as a whole can be thought of as a cultural inscription that can be read to un better understand who we are as human beings and our culture and society. So we're interested in studying the range of activities and therefore the attitudes that, re that they reflect that play out across the land in the US. We think of landscape as a thing that is always shifting. It's fluid. It's a cultural product that is shaped by humans who are in turn shaped by their landscapes. And these are some of the thematic program areas we are interested in that are also kind of like curatorial guideposts for us. Uh, these distinct aspects of the built landscape that we feel together help create a portrait of land use in the US today. Though we are a national organization, our main office and uh, exhibit space is here in Los Angeles in Culver City. And the center functions both as a support system and venue for artists and researchers as well as its own creative research organization that produces and presents original in-house exhibits, research resources, public programs, and publications. Through our various programs, we point to things. Uh, we're not really experts at anything except perhaps pointing. Um, and in doing so, we hope to let people know what they can look at, but not necessarily tell them what to think about those things. But of course, in pointing one way, we are telling people to perhaps not look at everything else. And in that way, it is a form of curation. It's a point of view, kind of like this optical instrument. It's a frame, just like the museum or the institution is a frame that shapes our understanding or reading of whatever is inside of it. So at the center, we're very ground-based. We do a lot of field work and that research uh, out in the field often includes going to a place, ground truthing, things, seeing what there is to see, and really is based on kind of this embodied experience, um, almost approaching it from a child-like perspective, like our feet are on the ground, what do we see, what do we hear? Um, and, and then we document the site through things like documentary style photography, video, audio, and then we go back to the office and um, sort through this material as well as our notes, article clippings, maps, ephemera, um, and where it's processed and filed still in filing cabinets like this. Um, but many of these sites end up going into this thing we call the land use database, which is perhaps at the heart of our organization. It was founded in 1994 um, or started in 1994 at the same time as the organization was founded and is accessible on our website. 
Um, it's an ongoing inventory or collection of thousands of unusual and exemplary land use sites in the US that have been photographed and described by people involved with the organization. So this is one entry, um, Mexican Hat Uranium Disposal Slot in Utah, an unusual and exemplary waste land use site, I would say. Um, and so you have a couple images and taken by people involved with the organization, and then a short text and a link to the map. And the entries aren't meant to tell you everything you need to know about this, them, um, but give you enough information so you know where to look if you want to find out more. This is a cultural land use site, Felicity Center of the World uh, in California near the Arizona border. Um, kind of a visionary creation of this fellow named Jacques-André Estelle, who had a dream where he was told to kind of build this pyramid at this town uh, near, um, um, what's that? Okay, near the, uh, the Arizona California border on Highway 8. Um, and he, this town called Felicity, named after his wife, and he's now the mayor. But there's this pyramid, and in it, there is a, uh, a time capsule at the bottom, and you can visit it. But perhaps more relevant to the conversation today is this uh, series of slabs that he calls the History of Museum in Granite. And it's an ongoing project by Mr. Estell and his team where they're working to inscribe the whole history of humanity, at least as, um, as he sees it. Um, and uh, this is, you know, perhaps to leave some sort of material record for whoever finds us in the future um, of what happened, what played out on, on this land. Um, and you probably can't make it out on your tiny screens, but um, at the bottom, uh, there is the alphabet and then uh, the, uh, our numbers, as well as this uh, line of text that reads, on behalf of the people of the world, this monument is designed as a key for visitors of the far distant future um, to understand our writings. So this is perhaps a, a very literal example of archival grounds. Um, and these sites and photos in the land use database often find themselves in projects and exhibits we put together for our own facilities and for other public venues and museums. This is just a sampling of the exhibitions and projects. Um, they, these are actually just screen grabs from our website and you can click on each of these to learn more, but hopefully it gives you a scope, an idea of the scope of our programs. Um, and uh, the website, we really do think of it as our living archive of our organization and the ways in which most people um, probably access our work. But uh, one of the projects I'm working, just starting to work on now, involves researching the contemporary cultural interpretations of this geographic area known as the Bonneville Basin. A few thousand years ago, Lake Bonneville covered much of northwestern Utah and parts of eastern Nevada and southern Idaho. And today the basin is a dry salt pan and crusty mud flat. It's the largest, driest, flattest place in the United States. And it can be thought of as this hole in the middle of America where there's no drainage to the Atlantic or the Pacific Oceans. And some of the basin remains flooded still today, at least as uh, the Great Salt Lake. And the shores of this ancient lake are always shifting, receding back and forth, appearing in constant change and stasis simultaneously somehow. And with this research, I'm hoping to peel back the layers of this basin surface, revealing the physical remnants of the ancient lake's deep past, its recent histories, its current state, and also look towards premonitions of its possible futures. And at this moment when survival seems to be on all of our minds, on personal, national, global, and planetary levels, perhaps there's no better place suited to study survival, along with resilience and decay, than the Bonneville Basin this landscape that has seen these singular events and activities over time from its ongoing transformation from an inland ocean to salt flats and shrinking sand and lake across thousands of years to its role in the development of the first atomic bomb in World War II and the creation of visionary earthworks in the 1960s and 70s by artists such as Nancy Holtz and Robert Smithson. So my research over the next two years involves examining the cultural products and byproducts of this landscape's morphology while exploring broader themes of isolation, desiccation, inundation, solidification, and disintegration, and maybe other themes <laughs> that we don't yet know yet, um, as well as studying developments in contemporary art and cultural practices in and about the basin. 
The research will culminate in a new exhibit program at the CLUI's complex in Wendover, Utah, that reflects the range of contemporary activities and attitudes regarding this changing landscape and notions of survival. I'm gonna give particular attention to researching these underrepresented and new, especially emerging in the last 20 years, voices and narratives in and about the region. This is a place that the, uh, the center has done some research in the past, but much of it was done in the 1990s. And while a lot has stayed the same out there, a lot has also changed. And in addition, as a curator and educator, this research also involves exploring uh, responsive and innovative on-site modes of display, engagement, and field work, particularly in remote and perhaps contested environs. So since 1996, the center has operated this complex at the ruins of a World War II military base in Wendover on the edge of the Salt Flats and at the borders of Utah and Nevada. The Nevada side is a casino town and the Utah side is that former World War II military base. It was the largest military reserve in the world in area by 1943 and housed the training program for the first atomic bombing missions. While some of the airfield is still uh, active military land, the county now owns and manages the airport and the 100 or so buildings that remain on the base, a few of which we rent out for some programs. So we have a public display facilities to present new and interpretive methodologies and ideas and information about the region. This building you see here is our orientation building. We meet with groups and classes. And in this photo, uh, you might see from some familiar faces. Um, this is actually a meeting with a, some USC landscape architecture and fine arts students. And it's open to everybody though, the general public uh, in non-pandemic times. Um, access to this site and most of our non-LA exhibit facilities has been by this push button door code system. Uh, very simple, you call the number on the door to get the access code. And inside you'll see some displays uh, created by folks involved with the center uh, about the region. Uh, we have a couple of other buildings. This is uh, an old barracks building that is used to host uh, special projects by artists and other creative researchers. And over the years, we've hosted hundreds of artists and folks working on projects about the region and its phenomenologies on projects that can only really be done in Wendover. And Katie was actually in residence with us uh, several years ago. This is, a, I'll go through just a couple projects to show kind of the work that has been done and what we'll be expanding on. But this is a work by William Lamson who constructed a room sized diorama in a World War II armament building. Uh, and he was interested in exploring salinification. And the chamber became more and more encrusted in salt crystals over time, dripping salt water that was collected from the intrepid potash canals that are nearby. Hans Bauman researched microbialites. They're sometimes referred to as these living stones. These are carbonate rock structures that can grow over 30 feet tall and be over 10,000 years old. And they are once the dominant life form on this planet. But today, the North Arm of the Great Salt Lake uh, is one of the few places where these ancient organisms persist. This is called the Clean Living Unit. It was created in 2003 by Simpark, who were interested in creating an off-the-grid live work facility. And they were also interested in engaging ideas of sustainability, utopian communal living experiments like Biosphere 2, as well as myths of the frontier and the industrial military legacy in the US. The facility is located at South Base, the former munitions area for the Wendover Air Base that remains sealed off from the public on restricted access land that is still sometimes used for military and police training activities. So one of the ideas behind Clean Living was to support creative research in this place that was the site of such intense and perhaps the darkest of activities, a representative of the extremes of what humans are capable of, and to see if it was possible to cultivate something generative and even hopeful on these testing grounds. So through this research, I'm hoping to build on the work that already has been done, approaching this basin as a remarkable crucible of extreme ideas, activities, and conditions that have been tested and distilled. And in this new exhibit program, hope to offer expanded ways of viewing and understanding the shifting landscape and the lessons it can offer in times of immense cha changes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you much, very much, Aurora, and to all of you. Um, and now I guess my challenge is to try to find a couple questions that will unite all those projects together. In the meantime, I would encourage you to think about uh, questions you might want to pose after having heard one another's presentations. Um, uh, you might have rethought your own projects after hearing other folks can maybe use some similar language. Or for, one thing I'm particularly interested in is how like excavation is used in different contexts, what the different kind of connotations, ideologies, methodologies, epistemologies are, are embedded in the whole process, the verb of excavation, and how that might mean something different in each of your projects. But, um, and I, I tried to put this together, I hope it's not an over-determined, over-packed question, but given that each of you talked about how the grounds on which you're working are multiple things simultaneously. They have, there are multiple German, uh, overlapping jurisdictions, they are environmental preservation zones, and also kind of, um, crime scenes and they are military jurisdictions and they are sites of environmental preservation. I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk about how these competing ontologies of your of your field might create different challenges for archiving the ground. So for going back to Ayana's really fantastic question is how do we reconcile these distinctions, maybe these competing demands that come with trying to find your words of um, environmental preservation and cultural preservation. Liz is maybe talking about how, if we're thinking about Guantanamo Bay as both a site of kind of, of long-term cultural re um, uh, reclamation or um, restitution, at the same time, it is kind of a, a live crime scene. Uh, and, and, and Katie, you're talking about kind of maybe longer term ecological evolution versus the long history of, of a commercial or maybe even industrial farming versus the immediate needs of like having to serve as a studio site. And Aurora, you're talking about super intense layers of deep time. So I'm just wondering maybe how the layeredness of your individual sites might create these um, maybe sometimes competing interests that have to be reconciled as, as when you think of the site as an archival space. Hope that's not, probably is too much because I always put too much in, but hopefully that's at least generative. I can dive in. Sure. I was, I was looking at folks with their mics like muted or not muted. I didn't want to talk over anyone. <laughs> um, well, at the estate, Little Princess, as I mentioned, it's the home of the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the largest land or privately landowning um, companies in the U.S. So there's this understanding when we came to that site that their primary sort of goal at that space or in that space is environmental conservation work. And you can see that in the sort of ways in which they've cared um, for specific spaces on that site. So when we got to the estate Little Princess, the majority of the grounds where the enslaved village area was located were completely overgrown. And there wasn't a real um, sort of um, pathway in terms of thinking about Katie's work or Aurora's work to even guide people who came to that site to that specific area to even think about that history there. There was a guide towards the environmental conservation work. And we see that often. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with the Society of Black Archaeologists as well as with another nonprofit, Diving with a Purpose, that is trying to really continuously weave in these stories and the ways in which cultural preservation and environmental conservation have to always go hand in hand. In a more sort of detailed or concrete way that that comes up for me, are thinking about um, the sort of wreck sites from ships involved in the transatlantic slave trade that DWP and the, and the Slave Wrecks Project are currently uncovering and excavating around the world. These sites have been resting on the bottom of the ocean for centuries at times and have created entire ecosystems around them. So there are constant conversations with archaeologists as well as with uh, marine scientists around what to make of these new environmental spaces. So I think that to answer your question, it's very difficult. There's no easy sort of um, sort of step-by-step -step guide or methodology for doing this work. And oftentimes it means for scholars who find themselves at the intersection of these two spaces to really juggle competing interests from um, oftentimes their funders at the case for the case for the estate little princess, you know, we have to come to the TNC every year and ask for permission to excavate on their private land. So it requires that we be in conversation with their goals and desires at that site. And while they've been huge supporters of the work, it also means that whenever we're excavating at that site, we can't cut down any um, endangered sort of or 
native species um, of plants that are at that site, which is also very difficult in terms of, you know, wanting to have accurate sort of um, excavation um, units and, and, and discrete areas of excavation. All of that is very difficult to sort of um, be in conversation with, but I think it just, it takes that sort of juggling and handling and oftentimes tender conversations. Thank you. I don't necessarily want to call you out, Liz, but given that you have talked about the, <laughs> one of your foundational challenges here, so I'm wondering if you want to pick up this theme. Yeah, I mean, for in, in the context that I've been working in, it's not um, merely a kind of disciplinary disconnect. It like really um, thwarts the pursuit of, um, of justice in a, in a real way. So um, I'm really interested in finding ways um, to bridge uh, the, this divide. And um, I think it partly takes kind of people individuals who are willing to work outside of the um, structures that they're really bound by. So the tensions, as I, as I mentioned, um, between people working with ground, like I've been in a lot of situations where um, the forensic archeologists who are part of a sort of, of a prosecution process um, treat ground, you know, when you treat ground as a crime scene, a lot of times they're literally looking for bones. And once the bones are really carefully, are identified, found really carefully, um, you know, placed back with their families, the site itself is like they're done and the bulldozers come. And so, um, you know, I've often tried to sort of be linking um, the real needs of, uh, of, uh, of the legal teams for immediate justice and honor for specific victims and their families and the long-term collective um, conscience that requires a totally different way of thinking about a place as a future memorial or a future space of reflection or a future. So it's this tension between um, lawyers who have to think about represent individual clients or think about individual people um, whose histories therefore can only have spanned a single lifetime at most. And usually their contact with a site is only a couple of years with you know, a real like stratigraphy, you know, a real like, you know, stratigraphy, palimpsest, these are all words that folks use in these presentations, which is a necessary, um, which is a totally different way of literally the way you treat a ground. Like how deep do you go? How much do you say? Like in very practical terms, it's a very different way of treating this, the, what's there. Um, and then the other, the other tension is between what you're able is between sort of individual research and expertise and kind of participatory engagement with the past. And sort of our whole theory of change is about this participatory long-term engagement. As you saw in the Guantanamo project, we had like thousands of people across the country all looking at this history in the same time together. And you can't, you know, have that Although it, you know, all of you have used to work with your students in these wonderful ways, but um, you can't have that treatment of ground um, when you are needing to preserve um, something that's going to stand up to legal scrutiny um, and have an archive that's going to stand up for a, a, a kind of testimony that will stand up for uh, legal to legal scrutiny. So the kind of individual and the collective, the short term, the immediate justice and the long term. Um, and I just have been lucky enough with these two examples and several others to have people who are, uh, you know, are working within particular constraints that they're never going to be able to get out of. Like they can't defend, they can't defend or do a death penalty defense looking at, you know, um, colonialism. But, um, but they're, they understand the, the value of it. And that's why this lawyer reached out to us, you know, and it's why uh, it worked with the Mencio and Sede case as well, who, who, and who understand the value and are, and are like recognize the moment when they have to reach out and bridge that gap. So before the bulldozers come, the law, you know, uh, to have somebody who's, who recognizes the potential of a site to be a future um, site of reflection. So 
you know, I think like if we all can build spaces for people who are willing to step to, to, to break from their frames, to step into a new frame together, um, then, you know, it really matters if we can do that. It makes a big difference. I wonder if Aurora or Katie want to add anything. I mean, Katie, I'm thinking, or I'm thinking about the fact that you you use the metaphor. Speaking of stratigraphy, Palum says use the word crucible, which implies kind of high heat, a lot of kind of uh, friction, frictionful mixing here. So I'm wondering if you could maybe unpack that. It sounds so academic. Unpack that metaphor, but <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly. And um, I mean, coming, I come from a background in the arts, and so. I think one of the wonderful things about approaching this really complex and massive, complicated place um, as a curator is I'm really learning from a lot from others who are experts from other disciplines. And one of and one of the challenges is this this um, this feeling like this place is changing so quickly, but then being reminded of, wait, no, it's just, it's always been changing. Um, and one of the texts I kind of refer to again and again, that's kind of been just so formative in my thinking and trying to understand um, the layering of contemporary art or putting a contemporary lens onto kind of these geologic time and places is um, the work of Lucy Lepard. Um, the, her book Overlay has been kind of just really instrumental to, to um, trying to navigate that, as well as more contemporary uh, writings um, like by uh, Marsha Bjorn, Bjorn Arud. Um, she has a concept called timefulness, as well as, you know, uh, John McPhee and even, and then and the idea that I'm also looking and pointing to a range of um, sources. So not just, uh, we're not academics. And so we are able to kind of draw as much from something like a pop culture film, like The Core, and how that is shaping our understanding, our contemporary reading the place as much as, you know, The Spiral Jetty or, or um, even this, this book uh, by Rachel Kushner, The Flamethrowers, or even fiction like, um, you know, um, J.G. Ballard and uh, Octavia Butler's writings, who aren't, which aren't even specifically about the place, but especially when we're thinking about ideas of resilience and, you know, um, what might be possible, what might be possible in these places, I found them incredibly helpful. Um, and then I also just have the benefit of having kind of a lot of time, I think it's been, I've, I've feel quite privileged to have a couple years to continue to, to do this research, um, both um, away from the site and on the site, and just um, bring in a lot of different voices. And again, the, the center, we don't really take a, a stance as an environmentalist organization or an activist organization. We're also not pro-industry or anything. Um, but the idea, one idea is to showcase this range of perspectives and activities and attitudes that exist. Um, and it is, and so the language we use also is, is very specific um, in these exhibits. It will be for a general adult audience um, and um, hopefully be something that that a range of folks can understand, but but I try to remind myself. I use that word crucible, but it, it's a place that has boiled over. I feel like many times, um, and will continue to. Well, thank you, and I think you've also effectively answered a question that somebody posed to you in the Q and A: is what literature, what ideas are informing your process? You've already touched on that, and I think it's also an important reminder to see how fiction um, or fabulation is, in way, some cases, um, mixed up with forensic research, which, you know, given Ayana's uh, kind of um, inspiration from uh, Black feminist theory, you know, this idea of critical fabulation, if you don't have a material record for, for a variety of reasons, because of colonialism, white supremacy, and a whole host of factors, sometimes fabulation is kind of a necessary way to fill in the gaps in the archival or the geologic record. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Ayana, or if Katie, you want to add anything, I, then I have one more question. Also, I want to invite people to pose questions in the Q&A because we'll take the last 15 minutes or so to take your questions. So please feel free to put stuff in there. Do you want to add anything, Katie? I know I, know I was speaking before. I wanted to give Katie a chance if she wanted to add anything. You, you go ahead. I'm, I'm still thinking and absorbing. <laughs> No, no problem. Shannon, your point around critical fabulation definitely feeds very central into the work that I do. And as I mentioned before, 
um, while we have the archaeological record to come to to really speak towards the experiences that are oftentimes um, strategically erased, silenced in um, the archive on the transatlantic slave trade, so heavily, heavily, you know, centered on documentary evidence. Um, even I, I do a lot of um, work around how even within the sort of space of cultural mediation that goes into archaeological work and the analysis of uh, material culture, there's still this sort of space of epistemic violence that could take place even when we have materials coming from the people themselves that also must be handled with um, care. I think a lot about the work that Liz has shared thinking through um, Catherine McKendrick's work around demonic grounds and thinking about the ground itself as um, very animated at times. And I think that also speaks to Katie's work as well and the ways in which um, we come to see the ground as like a sort of stagnant place, but it's constantly in motion and the histories themselves are living out in many ways based upon the sort of embodied experience that people have moving through that space. Katie, when I think about your work, I think a lot about um, how early on at the Estate Little Princess, when we were doing a lot of community engaged um, practices and, and having these really beautiful conversations with community members, what it meant to actually walk with community members at the Estate Little Princess. Um, and it completely ch ch changed and shifted the ways in which we took in that site and how even folks who weren't oriented to the enslaved village area still had memories of childhood, like when their parents used to mow the grass in that area, like in the 80s and the 70s. And they would remember running around that space and finding artifacts on the ground. Um, so I think about the ways in which memory um, is so directly linked to the land and how people would come to that space and remember that space in many ways um, over time, so yeah. And walking is such a, it's a, such a communal activity or it certainly used to be, I think, in, in many cultures. And um, that's why I think it's so important in my own work that I'm not just doing these kind of solitary investigations, but I'm working with students um, and with, uh, with the university to engage a lot of different um, voices. And I think the only other thing I would sort of add to this um, conversation is um, thinking about, you know, as, as a landscape architect, I'm very kind of focused on ecology and environmental conditions. And so I'm, I, I like to think of um, things not so much sort of trying to separate cultural from ecological, from geologic, but rather thinking about um, the, the sort of cycles of growth or decay or different time spans that, that these things occupy, um, longer, shorter, how they erode, um, how they change over time. Um, and I think focusing on really observing change and I try to do that with my students by taking the students back to the same place over and over and over again. And I think through that, we're able to actually start to appreciate really, really small changes that are happening um, in a really short time span, which maybe we don't, um, uh, maybe we kind of take for granted sometimes, um, but I think are really also important in, in cultivating a, a careful awareness and kind of presentness um, in where we are. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. So while I'm still waiting for some other folks from the audience to pose questions, I see that Claudia has her hand up. Unfortunately, we can't allow people to vocalize their, their comments or questions. So Claudia Steenberg, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. But I think that Yana and Katie's exchange here really was a nice transition into the final, hopefully final question that I will ask. And that is, um, what is the unique cross-pollination that is made possible by our five presentations here tonight. I'm wondering, maybe um, Katie's discussion of walking had really interesting resonances with Ayana's work. Or for K Katie, your discussion of like using GPS as a drawing, as a tool for drawing was really like provocative for me. I'm wondering if in hearing other peeps, um, people's work about the way they use particular, particular terminology that might be used in your field or the methods they discussed, if it made you maybe think about how you could do something differently or offer new resonances with your own practice. Uh, 
I wrote down, and I'm going to think about this a lot more, but I was really, uh, I loved the uh, Ayana's phrase of a stratigraphy of colonial and imperial violence, which working on, um, on this site uh, with so many layers of that, but thinking about a stratigraphy of violence, um, that's something I'm going to chew on and um, seems really important, and I really want to think her for that. Appreciate it. Likewise, I mean, I feel like that is something that can be applied certainly to um, some of the sites I am looking at and thinking about. And I just really appreciated all of your work um, and uh, especially on like, how do you address these the layers and the complexities of such complex sites that have been the site of such such intense, you know, activities by humans, and also how can you, um, kind of Ayana and Liz, kind of just in particular, was interested in seeing how your your work studying the ground is kind of um, as a way to process and kind of push back about some of these settler colonial structures that, you know, um, the center is really about studying those settler colonial structures in the US, um, but how can we continue to expand on the ways we're, we're doing so? And then with um, Katie, I mean, I love, love, love your way of walking as kind of a tool, a process, a regenerative activity and as, as drawing and, and it's something I, I um, really, just believe is so effective, but I loved seeing how you work with your students to create those collaborative drawings and seeing it really as a, a process and an action. And those are things I can imagine um, working quite well in, in a range of, of sites. And, and um, again, as I'm thinking through these, these exhibits for um, Wendover, um, I hope to, you know, not just work with visual artists, but folks from a lot of different disciplines. So this was really, um, exciting, so thank you. Something that I, I noticed, I think uh, there's a sort of thread with all of us is that I think all of us focused really on sharing a method or a way of practicing um, what we're doing and putting a much more focus on how we do these things uh, rather than what the end product is. And I, I know that's definitely important um, in my work, but I saw it um, with, with all of the presenters today. And, and that was really inspiring to me as well. I think, sorry, I wanted to also add something that's coming up for me is also thinking about the space of the digital in a lot of our work as well and how um, through these sort of different digital technologies we're taking um, I think about like the analog movement of walking, like we're, we're trying to like create these visual representations of the research that we're doing. And I'm always trying to, I'm always sort of grappling with the ways in which we can still do this digital work and still be embodied in it. And I think that Katie, your work reminds me so thoroughly of that, of that just embodied experience of it. And even in Aurora's work around like what it means to guide people to specific spaces, like what does it mean to be human in those spaces and even still try to capture that and somehow display that online. I think that this will be a consistent sort of struggle as um, these sort of spaces of online and, and through screens becomes like a dominant way that we're communicating not only our research, but also like with each other. Um, so yeah, so that's something that's coming up for me in this space. Any additional comments for anybody before I can ask a question from the audience? I also want to encourage you, maybe once we get through this question, maybe we will have space for if you would like to pose the panelists to pose a question that um, you'd like for us to spend our last few minutes on. But the question, one question I've received from the audience is, we were talking a lot about space and place, which have been theorized by lots of David Harvey, Disserto, et cetera, tons of people, Doreen Massey. Uh, I'm curious, from your own epistemological and ontological anchorings, how you conceptualize these terms, maybe the distinctions, overlaps between space and place. Only asking because there are so many understandings of these terms. So I'm wondering if those distinctions are, are important in your own work. 
I think even just going back to Ayana's point that some of the theorists of space and place would definitely put space in the digital category, you know, the vectored understanding of space, and then the place would be the embodied bringing into being through your motion through it. But and um, that's exactly what I was I yeah. was thinking as well is that place always has felt so embodied, and I actually turned to um, a lit like I, I turned to a piece of literature actually whenever I think about place, um, and in Toni Morrison's beloved. She writes about how going back to this lake, or this particular waterway, the ways in which that space captured the particular sort of horrors of enslavement and what was left there were like, the, the, the place that was created was left through like footprints. Like there's something about like being in particular place um, that always has felt more of an embodied experience in, in my own research. And I think the sort of extrapolation of that or the abstraction of it as space through the digital, through, you know, GIS technologies, things like that. Um, I think there's always a sort of like back and forth between the two of how to, how to make sure that they're still in, in conversation with one another. So... And Katie's work is a great example of that and that kind of integration of taking what the the the, the, the tracing the sen the um the tracing which typically has a negative connotation when you look at sensor technologies but you co-opting it using it instead for kind of almost a feminist methodology there's a lot with a feminist GIS to instead use it as a tool for drawing and re-embodiment so anybody else have space and place thoughts um, I'll add, I mean, I feel like place, um, I agree with, with um, all of what Ayana said. Um, to me, place is very much tied to people and it's subjective and it's, it's different for each of us. And I think it is very much tied to kind of the human experience and kind of what we each bring to this, the, the, the place. And I think it's also, sorry, not to use the same word in my definition of it, but um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's like landscape is something that it's constructed and develops and can shift. And it's yeah. Any other thoughts? We have I'll I'll let it sit for a second and then I have do have another question in the QA. The only other context that I'm really learning from everybody about, and that's um, really wonderful that all of this is informing is about um, is about reckoning and um, the I'm really inspired by the idea of walking from you Katie of walking as a different kind of form of reckoning or a, a different vehicle for reckoning or what that could look like um, so it doesn't exactly respond to the space place um, but you know, another as I mean, another direction that um, it's something that's evolving everywhere is um, really um, more attention to reparations and redress in a serious way in this country, which is incredibly, uh, you know, this is really unusual and it's a really amazing development. And I think that that has like posed a whole bunch of new questions and like thrown a lot of what we're talking about into a, a, a new context if we're just thinking about um, different, you know, all of the, the modes and moves for redress and, and reparations like are rooted in any of these grounds. And so how do we really um, activate those archives in this effort of reparations and reckoning and then also uh, and, and redress? And then also what are the kind of acts of reckoning, um, ways of connecting people to that ground. Um, and so that this idea of walking as reckoning is a um, really interesting one that I'm just grateful to have planted in my head. Do you wanna add anything, Katie? You don't have to, that's okay. Just want to give you space if you'd like to. But um, uh, Allison and Rosiak, I know you wanted to save some time at the end. Do we have time for one more question? It's kind of a big one. Or would you like to close and then have your your kind of forward leaning uh, closing no, no, go comments? Ahead. Go ahead, open it. Okay, all right. So uh, the, the additional question in the, in the uh, Q&A is, um, 
What are some specific ways that your processes for archiving and collecting have changed over time as you kind of learn more about your site and your methods? And then how does your perception of a site change after you've begun to pull from its archive? So in, in my work, the site is, I mean, the site is the archive and the, the, the way the site changes is a sort of changing reflection of um, sort of additions, maybe you could say to the archive or edits to the archive or curation of the archive. Um, so I don't see a separation be between sort of things that are being removed from a place, um, but rather um, that the place is is essentially the um, the record. Um, and I think the more familiar I become with uh, a site, um, I probably also carry a lot of the archive um, in my own um, sort of embodied knowledge as well. But I I I sort of in my particular point of view, I don't see a separation there. I just want to intersect really quickly, and I think there's actually a really interesting concept to be used from archival uh, practice here, the whole idea of the post-custodial archive, where you can take the expertise of archivists to do records management, but the actual materials themselves stay with the community, so it doesn't require bequeathing all of your material culture to an institution. So I think there's something kind of dealing, addressing issues, the histories of colonialism there. So in a way, your, your archive of field as archive is a post-colonial archival collection, Katie, or sorry, post-custodial. Yeah, I think for me, you know, if you, when you come to the field of archeology, span there's a way that there, there's a way that archeologists come to a site as like the sort of expertise of a site. Um, and I think at getting at this sort of notion of like post-custodial archives, I think the ways that I've, the, the sort of shift that I've made and how I come to archaeology, and it likely is because of um, the sites that I look at and the communities that are immediately impacted by that work and that are central to the work. I think I'm coming to my projects um, really thinking about who I'm in service to, which was not a question at the top of my head when I initially got into this work, where the sort of quest is for you're trying to learn something new, explore something new versus like, are you in service to this quest of knowledge or are you in service to like the community that is impacted by this work that lives around this work that lives at this site? And that's a completely different shift in the sort of research questions that are coming up for me, but also the ways in which people are in commune with the particular artifacts themselves. And I think this understanding of like how people can um, care for and be custodians, be cultural stewards of their own grounds is still a very sort of contentious conversation right now in archaeology, where archaeologists put so much stake on being expertise of this knowledge and the sort of notion around consultation versus genuine collaboration with communities um, is not the norm yet. Um, so I think that's been the sort of major shift in the ways that I've come to this. Um, and I think I've also done a lot of work um, around thinking through what is constituted as like fact versus fiction, especially in like the desire to um, utilize the speculative as a space of redress and a space of transformation for both past, present, and future. Um, and I think being postgraduate student has allowed me to play with that more. And I still can't play with it to the full extent because I don't have tenure yet. <laughs> so I'm still like beholden to like disciplinary um, sort of like unspoken rules, but like the people who will say whether or not your work is academic enough. Um, but I think that all of that is, is coming up for me and I, I get to sort of expand and stretch out a bit more. So yeah. I'm gonna jump in. Thank you guys all so much. You've opened up so much. I feel like we're sort of ending on a, a note of opening up, which always seems to be the case, but this idea of the speculative, but also, you know, issues of sort of the language around custodians versus stewards versus, you know, sites of care. And um, 
And I, I've just been sort of fascinated by all your investigations of ground as a system and a knowledge holder rather than a sort of collection of discrete artifacts. So this has been really amazing. And there was a, a panelist side conversation about deploying Katie's method across some of these other sites and other investigations. I think that would be truly interesting. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so curious to continue my conversation with Katie about embodied knowledge. So I think the idea of like holding the archive within oneself is also such an amazing aspect of, of what came out of tonight. So thank you so, so, so much, all of you for your stamina. And I know a lot of you are in late night mode right now. So um, again, thank you. This was really wonderful. Um, I will actually, Jared, do you mind putting up the, the slide for, um, so we, in two weeks, we will be having a conversation. Actually, we started the conversation tonight around sort of conflict and sort of contestation over um, different values and priorities on a site. Um, next session will be around shaky grounds and it will largely be around both sort of geophysical and geopolitical um, conflict and the shakiness of the ground in that, in that context. So we'll hear from a, a whole range of academics, practitioners, artists, scholars. So we look forward to having you then. And again, thank you very, very, very much, all of you panelists. And thank you for those of you who made it through the, the two hours. <laughs> and panelists, if you don't mind, just if you can just stay.